Only God knows the future. God does not permit us to see it. And this is, of course, one of his greatest gifts. If we could see the time and the manner of our death, it would totally destroy our enjoyment in our life because we would be waiting for that minute, that moment, all the time. Since we cannot, we are free to enjoy the great gifts of life with all its beauty and joys, all its challenge, in large measure because of its uncertainty. So that when we talk about what's next, we are really looking at the future only from the perspective of the present and the probabilities it contains for the immediate prospect. After all, within the confines of a very short life, we cannot possibly take a long view. We are more often surprised than verified. Nobody in 1901, for instance, could possibly have foreseen the carnage, the destruction, the shattered illusions of World War I, or the dynastic collapses that took place. And today, as usual, in the final decade of a century, we are surrounded with millennial gloom with arguments that the use of oil and coal and the results of industrial processes and forests is creating a greenhouse effect that is warming the globe and threatens the survival of the polar ice caps with consequent floods and destruction. We are told that nuclear and biological weapons in the hands of fanatics threaten all human life. One critic, Arthur C. Banto, has discussed the end of art. The New Yorker writer Bill McKibben has written on the end of nature. And more recently, American intellectuals have seized upon an article titled The End of History, written by Francis Fukuyama, the deputy director of the State Department's policy planning staff. When it appeared, the article was accompanied by responses from Irving Kristol, Senator Daniel Moynihan, and Dr. Alan Bloom, all of whom are influential names in the United States. What did Fukuyama say? Essentially, he said that because the communist mystique is fading in the Soviet Union and in Red China, that the Cold War is over, and that, quote, Western liberal democracy, end quote, has won in the struggle of ideas. He also tied this into the idea that the ideological struggle as a whole will come to an end, and that history, as he understands the term, will also come to an end and then being a true bureaucrat of the intellectual class, he says that this conclusion comes to him from Hegel. Within weeks after its appearance, Fukuyama's essay was extensively quoted and debated. His photograph appeared in Time magazine. The French quarterly commentaire said it would devote an entire issue to it. BBC sent a television crew to interview the author, and translations were commissioned in Dutch, Japanese, Italian, and Icelandic. 10 Downing Street asked for a copy. All this for 16 pages. The phenomenon is remarkable enough to excuse a, a bit of a digression on his background. We discover that he is from a Christian Japanese family that he was raised in New York City, and that his father was a congregational minister, that he attended Cornell University and became a, pre a protege of Dr. Alan Bloom, 
who himself became famous only a year or so ago for a book attacking the American public educational system while praising the principles, if they can be called that, of Rousseau. Fukuyama studied the classics as an undergraduate in comparative literature in graduate school at Yale, where one of his professors was Paul de Man, the guru of deconstructionism, that is the theory that words don't mean anything, who is now in disgrace because it was discovered he wrote pro-Nazi articles during World War II. And then Fukuyama spent six months in Paris where he studied with Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida and later said he didn't like their intellectual nihilism. He then entered Harvard to study Middle Eastern and Soviet politics in the government department. After three years, he obtained a doctorate in political science with a dissertation on Soviet policy. And the rest was a climb through the inner passageways of government corporations, and finally a high post inside the State Department. His piece, The End of History, reflects the euphoria inside Washington, which does think that the Cold War is over and that the future is wonderful for the West in general and the United States in particular. There's little point in tracing the interconnections between Fukuyama's sponsors. Let it suffice to say they're a tight little circle in Washington known as neoconservatives. Now, this particular group is known for its disdain for Christian reconstruction and actually for Christians and Christianity in general. And the members enjoy a disproportionate influence. Fukuyama reflects their ideas. For our purpose, he writes, it matters little what strange thoughts occur to people in Albania or Burkina Faso. And at least one recent reviewer has assessed his article as revealing, quote, a veiled contempt for the very culture whose triumphs in the political sphere it purports to celebrate, end quote. Why spend any time on this unpleasant and rather shallow thinker? Where does he fit into Christian Reconstruction? Quite simply, in the enemy camp. It's important to know the ideas and the tactics, the connections and the maneuvers, the strategy and the efforts of such spokesmen. The appearance of a Francis Fukuyama, who is the very epitome of the polyglot American culture of today, illustrates a common American pattern. The father was a Christian minister, the son went to a fashionably sectarian college, and is now a spokesman for American humanists. The very title of his article, The End of History, is straight from Marx. Fukuyama speaks of a universal, homogeneous state in which all prior contradictions are resolved and all human needs satisfied. The struggles of life will be replaced by, quote, economic calculations, the endless solving of technical problems, environmental concerns, and the satisfaction of sophisticated consumer demands, end quote. Engels said it more succinctly. He said the government of persons is replaced by the administration of things and the direction of the process of production. Marx said communism is the solution to the riddle of history. Nothing could more dramatically illustrate the triumph of Marxism in American education than Fukuyama's use of Marxist and Hegelian reasoning to claim a victory over it. On its own, this contradiction seems inherently and unusually implausible, but it's not on its own. There is much in the world today about glasnost and perestroika 
which has been paraded as an end to the third world, or the competition between the superpowers about their respective satellites, among which we can include the nations of Europe as a whole. There is also much about the decline of the communist mystique in the Soviet Union and Red China. But this decline has been accompanied by a remarkable rise of a new movement which goes by the name of environmentalism. It has risen coincidentally with the Soviet discovery that it cannot steal Western technology and apply it without creating a Western infrastructure and allowing individuality. In order to do that, the USSR would have to abandon its system of government, and no rational person expects that to peacefully occur. In its competition with the West, therefore, the Soviet has always understood that Western technology would always stay ahead unless some way could be found to cripple it without war. World atheism and anti-Christianity pursued that objective through various avenues of propaganda and subversion through the years. But it was not until the beginning of the 60s that it found the seemingly perfect tactic, one that used the strength and idealism of the West against itself, and one that could not be tangibly connected to the Kremlin. It began with the last book of a gifted nature writer named Rachel Carson. Miss Carson was dying of cancer and having no faith, believed that the world would die with her. In 1962, she wrote a fantasy called Silent Spring about a world without birds, about a world poisoned by pesticides, strangled by pollution. In 1965, Ralph Nader wrote Unsafe at Any Speed about Detroit, the very heart of the American industrial system, dedicated, he said, to making deliberately death trap automobiles. These hysterical efforts merged at a time when the American courts had resumed their anti-business tilt of the 30s and when antitrust suits were numerous the health and safety, environment, and stop business lobbies took a giant leap upward from the mid-1960s onward. Paul Johnson, the British historian, wrote that these books, quote, introduced an era in which the protection of the environment and the consumer became a quasi-religious crusade fought with increasingly fanatical zeal, which, he said, had a peculiar appeal to the hundreds of thousands of graduates now pouring off campuses as a result of an expansion of higher education, eager to find ways to express the radicalism they had absorbed. Nothing, he concluded, was more calculated to produce a climate hostile to business than the growth of the health and safety lobby. To become a salient feature, it became a salient feature of American life from the mid-1960s onward and was soon reflected in a mass of regulatory legislation. Now, we don't have time to list all those measures. Let it suffice to say that in their aggregate, it was calculated that by 1976, they cost American business the equivalent of over $68 billion a year and over $100 billion a year by 1979. The impact upon productivity was dramatic. Coal production fell immediately by almost a third. Between 1967 and 1977, American productivity grew by only 27%, while Germany grew 70%, France 72%, Japan 107%. From the mid-70s onward, American production actually declined. The peak year of American productivity was 1968, 
when we made 34% of all the manufactured goods in the world. Twenty years later, in 1988, that ratio had fallen by more than half. In two decades, the United States productivity had cut in half and we began to experience a flood of foreign-made goods. But I'm getting ahead of the chronology. But when the Kremlin saw the immediate impact of environmentalism in the United States, it funded the Greens in West Germany to promote the same set of arguments with the same anti-Western tilt, the same anti-industrial tilt. And their progress has been interesting to watch. They began by combining soft pornography, as it's called, with strident environmentalism and its accompanying anti-industrialism. And in a very short time, they had acquired enough support, especially among the young and the sentimental, to operate on their own financially. The environmental movement even managed to survive the terrible effects of the OPEC oil embargo by claiming that the whole thing was only a ruse by the oil companies and industrialists to make more money. But the greatest accomplishment of the movement came most recently when the Soviet move Union had to admit to the world that its domestic economy was in a shambles. Shortages of soap, shortages of food, shortages of housing, shortages of health care, shortages of every material comfort for everyone except the members of the nomenclatura. And in this extremity, Gorbachev announced a series of relaxations. Criticism was to be allowed. New publications could appear to a limited extent. The black market, according to an interesting article by the Salisbury Review, an English Christian publication, the black market is being allowed to operate after normal working hours and quotas are fulfilled. And although there has been no abatement in the immense Soviet armaments industry or in its expansions in Africa, the Yucatan, and other parts, the USSR has issued a stream of propaganda about peace and cooperation. Meanwhile, the environmental movement in the United States and through Europe has, coincidentally with the Soviet problem, taken another giant leap forward. In the last year, its arguments have appeared in all American publications, all television and radio channels, in every town and city, and in all our institutions, by magic. At the last Parrot Summit, together with a plea for his empire to be taken into the European family of nations, Gorbachev spoke about the need for international cooperation to save the environment. The Soviets are concerned about the environment. And since then, a spate of articles have appeared, together with various environmental treaties, laying the groundwork for an exchange of land from the third world countries in return for the cancellation of Western loans and for a huge new bureaucratic organization to save the earth. These steps will replace the fading United Nations while knitting a single world together with strands of virtue buttressed by international regulations that will sail over national boundaries. That is on the environmental level. On the American level, environmentalists declared that the first state of regulations were insufficient and have demanded more and tougher laws. Lawsuits are being filed in every district against virtually every enterprise, ranging from mining to manufacturing, and this time including service industries such as laundries and dry cleaning establishments, restaurants, hotels, everything that requires movement, you must realize that we're all polluters, that's the reason we have flush toilets. Everything that's done 
disturbs the environment to some extent. The fact that the industrialized nations have a cleaner environment than the lesser industrialized nations is something the average person isn't told. And the latest estimates that this flood of regulations will emerge from the American Congress next year will cost our industries an additional $60 billion a year and wipe out tens of thousands of firms, factories, and businesses. And all of this is not cited because I am making a political or an industrial speech. This is a Reconstruction Conference. And as Christians, we have to analyze events, assess their benefits and their significance to Christianity in the world. The environmental movement is quite obviously a reflection of Rousseau's argument, quote, that our inward natures consisting of intuition and feeling are shared with all other living creatures, and hence the belief that man was made in the image of God is incomprehensible. That connection is perceptive, as is the further connection drawn by James Bowman with the Romantics and their love of scenery, Freud's complaints about the repressions of civilization, and Hitler's addiction to animals and vegetarianism. As a friend of Chalcedon looking at this particular situation reminded me, that the environmentalism is a return to animism and it's reflected in an unending series of nature films that appear on our government television channel and also are radiated through films, magazines, and even books, publishing, where animals are somehow or another better than anything else. Animism is, of course, the most primitive of all religions. It sees all forms of life, poisonous snakes, insects, couch vultures, tishy tishy flies, as equally sacred and equal to man. Animism and all forms of life are held to possess indwelling souls, and God is simply all forms of life combined. Pantheism in which the Romans held all religions equal, combines the idea that all life adds up to God. One might say that pantheism is animism after it goes to college. Now, these pagan ideas, primitive though they may sound, have never really died. When Christianity was young, its believers knew the difference between paganism and the faith. They recognized heretical ideas when they heard them. And times when Christianity weakens, as during the Renaissance and the so-called Enlightenment, and in the mid-19th century in Europe and the 20th century in the United States, these old superstitions come floating back to enter the minds of the weak and the unlearned through the persuasions of the lettered and the unscrupulous. Therefore, there is a great enduring temptation to be influential, to take control of others, to have power over them. And in this area, religion diminishes the power hunger, reduces men by placing them under God, and places a higher power over the open expression of earthly paradise. That's probably one of the reasons for the persistent campaign against the clergy, which seeks to remind men of God. It's one of the reasons why evil in this world always cloaks itself in goodness, always pretends to be acting on behalf of others, despite the wishes of others. I govern, said the shameful James I of England, not according to the common will, but the common weal. When we see such arguments mounted in combination with ambition and uttered by men without a belief in God, it's time to get a little scared. This is what is emerging in environmentalism. 
It has taken a sound observation, recognizing our duty not to injure God's world in our efforts, and expanded it into a revival of pantheism and animism. And the purpose of that revival, which began almost inadvertently, was to not only diminish Christianity, but to bring down the one nation where there are more churches and larger congregations than anywhere in the world. The greatest productive power ever known could not have been weakened and cut itself in half in two peacetime decades by any other means than by persuading it to commit industrial suicide. The fact that this persuasion was entwined with spiritual regression made it even more effective for our enemies. This satanic movement is peripheral, however, it was peripheral, until the Soviets admitted their economic disarray and Red China made the mistake of killing college students in front of American TV cameras. They got away with killing a million Tibetans, but college students are sacred in modern America. And the massacre of a few of them was enough for a time to turn away American popular infatuation, despite the cynical apologists of men without faith. The Soviet difficulties were more serious. They represent a public erosion of the collectivist dreamland. And make no mistake about it, our universities have become miniature collectives. They operate as do larger collectives where dissent is forbidden. They are bastions today of environmentalism, as well as bastions of Marxist and Hegelian platitudes. And as the socialist Marxist lure began to fade, the socialists have moved as though in unison into environmentalism. Why is that? What is there about saving a rare species, which is an odd gesture by environmentalists who presumably believe in the extinction of the unable? Uh, Nevertheless, they salivate to save snail darters or whatever. And this is from groups where Lenin once described communism as Marxism with electricity. The Kremlin boasted for decades about their rate of industrialization? Well, the real answer lies in regulations. The cloud of regulations raised pouring down upon American industry provide the bureaucracy with unlimited power to command and control, all in the name of goodness. While Gorbachev is claiming to reduce his centralization, of course he will not, the United States is being moved into an amazingly severe centralization. And of course environmentalism is not all that's being regulated. A child care bill is being considered that will hatch 38,000 local daycare commissions that will determine who will be allowed to care for the children of others. And that campaign against the family will cost many more billions. But more importantly, it will create many more regulations. There is an Americans with Disabilities Act, which makes it a criminal offense to tell jokes about homosexuals, or to turn a manic depressive down for a job, or to discriminate, a word that once meant choose, against the handicapped, which includes people with AIDS. All these measures and more create bureaucratic jobs, all restrict individual behavior and even individual expression. That's the important reason. That's why the environment, child care, the needs of the handicapped call for new laws. The purpose is control, not improvement. Improvement is the rationale. Control is the goal. And finally, then, 
we begin to see the shape of the Western future, at least from Washington, D.C. and the 50 American states. Who said democracy, a system of succession elevated to an ideology, is winning? What is it winning? I began with references to the end of history, but very little history is recalled by those who talk about its end. Russia, the argument runs, will cease to be expansionist if the West saves its murderous rulers from losing their positions. Why would that follow? Russian rulers suppressed Hungary in 1848. In 1799, Russian troops occupied Milan and Turin and fought near Zurich. They occupied the Ionian Islands in 1809. They are in every continent today. Why would Russia under new rulers become pacifists? In 1914, wrote Professor Huntington recently, Russia directly ruled more of Europe than Gorbachev does today. Meanwhile, let's look at Africa, North, Central, and South. Are its people more free than before the Atlantic nations had colonies? No. They have less freedom. Look at Asia. Is it more free than before? Are the Chinese better off than they were under the Manchus? Is Latin America in better condition without a powerful church? We see monsters murdering peasants in Peru and El Salvador, and drug lords killing judges in Colombia, and tyrannical rule in Nicaragua and Panama, and shambles in Brazil and Argentina, and shameful conditions throughout all Latin America. In what way is the world any better because the Soviets need money? The fact is that when we see ancient superstitions rising, and governments using them as a means of increasing their authority, we know that we are in a terrible time of troubles. We know in the United States that this has more to do with a Christian revival than anything else. We know that it is persecution which is beginning to awaken believers throughout the world and creating Christian communities. We also know that the massacres of Christians continues in many places and that restrictions on Christianity is increasing and not decreasing. We are confronted with all the instruments of propaganda, with the misuse of inventions brought to the world by Christians used against the Christian faith. Francis Fukuyama and his promoters are living examples of the powers and principalities we face of the folly of men in high places. We know that all the recent talk about peace is simply that. A world cursed and flawed cannot know peace without God. What is there next? What next? more of the same. This life is not a place where we shall find peace and contentment. It is a place of trial and testing. The purposes of God are unfathomable, but we know that all men, all human beings, despite their own urgings and desires, are instruments of God and are used for his purposes. And we know because he has told us that all things work for the best for those who believe. This conference, the first of its kind, brings us together across many thousands of miles, the first international effort to combat an international set of opponents. There is much more that can be said and done here, but I believe we will together plant the seeds of a new reconstruction a new reformation, if you will, that will launch us into a great effort to change the world. 
We who know that history began, that it is dated from the Transfiguration, know equally well that it will end only when the Redeemer returns. Men cannot end history, nor can men hold or halt the inexorable triumph of the faith, no matter how many and how subtle and how often they hold aloft false gods to mislead the world. We know that the enemies of Christianity today are involved in an effort to restore paganism and that they will end in the same graves as the Roman despots and the tyrants of the Renaissance, the brief rulers of France during the reign of terror, and the poseurs of the Third Reich and the bootstrap rulers of the Thirties. Our mission is to remind the world of the faith, to energize the faith into all the avenues of life, to rescue Christianity from the ghetto, and to restore it to its proper place and importance in the life of the world, to help people escape from the new bondage created by the new instruments of command and control. We know we will succeed because what will be next for us will be the proof, once again, that nobody can command and nobody can control the truth, the power, the majesty, and the directions of God. Thank you.